first a few words about this place because uh, I visited here but never on a Sunday service and so on. Um, so thank you for inviting me, uh, Dr. Paul and uh, Pastor Jordan, Pastor Patty. Thank you. It's great to be with you here today and with all of you. Uh, I've been to some of the biggest churches in the States with lots of, you know, hoo-ha, whatever. But the music here today, uh, so unique. I mean, seriously, you come to a place of worship, the house of Lord, and you get lifted up by such a group of talented people. God bless them. So, you know, thanks for the music. It's, it's very, very important. Um, Yes, it is a very special week. We are celebrating in Israel what um, seemed like maybe 60 years ago, 70 years ago, 100 years ago, a dream, just a dream. Imagine the eternal capital of Israel being united under God's first chosen, the nation of Israel. I mean, you know, Sometimes people get mixed up between um, what are the news, what do you feel about it, and what does your fate instruct you to understand and go deeper and deeper. You see, I know there are many people, especially in churches like this, that have been educated in church or they have it from home to support Israel. I know many of you don't even need to come to church to understand it, but I know that this church particularly, like many others, are educating you about this and telling you why. But I would like to go a little deeper into how do we see it from the Israeli side. So I'll start with a few remarks that maybe nobody ever uh, said before in the church. And because I don't mind being stoned for what I say ever, and I don't think there's any stones here, I will be very open and frank. So, you know, for me as a Jew, as an Israeli Jew, to stand in a church after 2,000 years that there was so much animosity and struggle between the two sister faiths, let's never forget it. Those are two sister faiths crafted in the same vine, from the same roots, from the same olive tree? What are we talking about? And for 2,000 years, it wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have been acceptable that a church would welcome a Jew. First of all, because for some reason, we are called non-believers. And I want to say something about it. We believed in the Almighty God just a few years before you ever heard of Him. Now, Am I saying it in a conceited way? No, God forbid. I love you for being my brothers and sisters. I do. I mean it. And you will learn in the next 20 minutes or so that whatever I say, I mean it from my heart. But, you know, this whole thing of who really knows God? Both of us. Your Messiah was from the people of Israel. The Son of God came from the people of Israel. He celebrated his bar mitzvah. If you don't know this, you have to read again and again the New Testament. I'll tell you another thing. And I know that some of the things may be shocking, but I'm saying it because I want us to put this all behind us and not leave those problems and say, oh, we're overlooking them. No, let's face them, and then we can move together because we have a shared mission that I will present to you later. But we have a shared mission. God has a mission for all of us, Jews and Christians as well. This is why we are sister faiths. Another thing that needs to be cleared once and for all is that we are not here to fight about whose faith is stronger or bigger or whatever. Faith is faith. God is God. That's all. There are no two gods who have created this world. There is only one God. You can't prosecute a sister or a brother of your own faith, even if it's a sister faith. We can't. But most of all, we have enemies. We do. The church has great enemies. 
the house of Israel, as we call it in Hebrew, Bet Israel, has enemies. And I'm going to tell you a secret now, just a secret. Those are the same enemies. The enemies of Israel are the enemies of the church. The enemies of the church are the enemies of Israel. I never get political when I talk because I really rely on this book, okay, the Bible. But I do want to share something, a thought, okay? And because I'm not a preacher and I'm not a teacher, I'm just a guest here to present some of what's going on in Israel and to invite you to work with us towards the glory of God. I want to tell you something that may sound political, but when America has a president that is not really nice, nice to churches, he's not nice to Israel as well. And when you've got a president who loves Israel, he loves the church. That is just a fact. Now, there's no elections next week, so I'm allowed to say this, right? I'm not getting anyone into troubles here. You know, I know the rules, but I've got to share this with you. This was only one example you see, when radical Islam is exploding and killing people in the streets of America, they do this because they call you the great Satan and us the small Satan. But at the end of the day, they see you and us as Satan. Of course, they are the Satan. There's no doubt about it, you know. I think that the word Satan is in flattering them. But those are the enemies of whoever whoever received the God of Israel and understood that there is one Almighty who created us, who made us. And we should be happy and thankful for that every day again and again. Now I want to say something about a church because sometimes I don't think that people understand the connection really between the Bible and the church. The church is not a social place to meet. While I truly believe that it's great to be together, you know, a congregation, a community, you know, from the times of the ancient times of Israel, through the times of Yeshua, you know, I never call him Jesus. His name was Yeshua. With all due respect, I'm not in Greece. That's a Greek name. So it's either you're going to make up an American name for him or just call him Yeshua, which was the name he was born with. So from the times of Yeshua and his followers and disciples, and at the... And, and, like also 2,000 years earlier, at the first early, early time of Israel, we gathered to pray. That is great. Because the power of prayer, when we're all together in a church or a synagogue, I mean, this is something you can't even understand. But also because God wants us to work together. There's no individual thing in the Bible. Even Jacob who later was named Israel after that night, you know, where he uh, lay his head, his head on the stone and had the dream. Thank you for reminding it. Even he was named not Jacob, but Israel because he became the father of the house of Israel. That means we work together. We are a group. We are a family. And when we come here, sometimes in a synagogue or a church, we come because we're used to as a social thing. You know, we go to church on Sunday. That's great, but every Sunday is a different Sunday. And every prayer is a different prayer. Now, the Bible wants us to hold our own personal commitment and be part of what the Bible and God has determined for us. You see, a united Jerusalem, just as an example, is the living word of God. It doesn't happen on the moon. Yes, it doesn't happen in America. It's in Israel. It's a little far away. You have to take two airplanes all the way down there. It could take 16 hours altogether. Well, maybe with the security check at the uh, airports today with the TSA, it may take two days. But yeah, they're like, oh, we want to check you. So they're holding you for an hour and they're just, just looking to the other side at all, you know. But anyhow, it happens in our lives. What I'm trying to say is that when we read the Bible, we don't read 2,000 years ago. We read two minutes ago. It's here. It's happening here. Again, you could tell me, what, are you a preacher? You're not even Christian. What are you telling us? Then look at this, a united Jerusalem. 
The Bible talks about it 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. You know, again, people say, okay, we'll go to church this Sunday. Okay, we'll go to the synagogue on Shabbat on Saturday, okay? But that's not about going there. That's about where do you find yourself within this community, within this congregation? What is your commitment to God? What is your commitment to God? Now, you know what? Not everybody can write a whole book about my commitment to God. Fine. But commitment to God means very simple things. First of all, believe in God. Believe in the Almighty. By the way, again, I'm going to tell you a secret. Okay? No, just a secret between us. I'm kidding. I'm really kidding. I'm, I'm just saying, it's you accept God. You invite God into your life. I did it. And I bet all of you have done that. Otherwise, I wouldn't have met you here. I invited him because I know that his word is stronger than anything else I met in life. How do I know this? Again, is this moving, by the way, behind me all the time? It is? Okay. No? It should be moving the slides right. So again, United Jerusalem. Because if you go to Isaiah 11, he talks about it. Here's a prophet 3,000 years ago, well, just a little less than 3,000 years, talking about Jerusalem will be united, the temple will descend from heaven, rebuilt, and it's there. It's happening today. Yeah, the temple is not there yet. But we managed 50 years ago to liberate all of Jerusalem, united. Why did we do it? I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something about being an Israeli. First of all, I got to tell you something. You know, Israelis and American Jews or Russian Jews are all Jews. But there is a difference. We are already, how would I call it? Excuse my English. Can I speak Hebrew instead of English? No, right? No. I'm looking at you for a confirmation, you know. Uh, Israelis are a little bit of a different breed of Jews. You know why? Because we already live in our own land. Now, there's nothing wrong about living here among so many good neighbors who love the Jews here and support them, but it's a whole different thing. As my parents, who are both Holocaust survivors, and I wish I could bring them over and you meet them. They're, they're really a charming couple. And they laugh all the time and they enjoy life. And they're 82 and 85. And, and, and seriously, I just took them for my father's birthday two weeks ago. I took them on a short flight because they can't fly, you know, too far to Bulgaria, which is like three hours from Israel on flight. And we booked into a weekend hotel and we had, we had the best time of our lives. But I want to tell you something about them. For years, when I was a kid and later, I asked my parents to tell me about the Holocaust. I know they suffered a lot, and I know that members of their family did not just vanish. Some of them were shot and slaughtered in front of their own eyes. And I told them, to, and for years they said, no, 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 we don't want to talk about it. And it's not because they were traumatized, which is also a good reason not to talk about, you know, if you're traumatized. It was because at one point they told me, we don't want to talk about it, because we're just happy that we survived the Holocaust and managed to get to Israel and give birth to two kids who served at the military and were able as Jews to hold a rifle and protect themselves. This is another prophecy that comes true in our own days. The people of Israel were dispersed for 2,000 years. But God has promised through Ezekiel and Isaiah that he will bring his children from four corners of the earth back to Israel. Did he not do that? Yeah, he did this. He did this, and my parents, who I just brought that story just to tell you that they were happy that their kids are not just Jews, they're Israeli Jews. They're already the same old Israelis like the Israelites who used to dwell in his land then we grew up in a different reality. We serve in our own military. We protect ourselves against the enemies of God. 
with our own rifle. We are not there to the mercy of anyone else. Because sometimes being under the mercy of other nations didn't bring us much success. As a matter of, they, as a matter of fact, they took our lives. Now it's different. So we as Israelis, as I told you, a little bit of a different breed from the regular Jews you meet here. We live in a reality where we feel that we are fulfilling the prophecies. We are fulfilling the dream. We are making a journey that is described 2,000 years ago in this book. Believe me, I think that I'm one of the best agents of this book because I live the book. I live there. This is Israel. The Bible is Israel. God is here in the book with us here everywhere where we take the book with us I know there's not enough room in the pockets but it's in our heart when we take it we take God everywhere and when we are offered his grace his blessing his protection his love nobody can say oh what you talking about we're talking about the book and the book is truth the book is day and day today the book is this week of a 50 years Jubilee of the unification of Jerusalem. Let me tell you how it happened in 1967. Well, most of you are younger, uh, young to, to, to remember this or to even learn about this. In 1967, Israel was surrounded by three bigger countries than Israel with bigger armies. Israel at that time had a population of hardly two million people, of which a small military was protecting that population, okay? I mean, if you have two million people, how big is your army, seriously? Now, the war between Israel and its enemies, neighbors, was with Syria, that at that time had about 15 million people. So you can imagine how big was the military. Jordan, who was almost the size of Israel, a little bigger uh, in terms of population, and Egypt, that was 40 million people. So 40 million plus 15 million, plus about two and a half or three million uh, in Jordan, that makes almost 60 million people in three countries attacking Israel with two million people. You want to talk to me about, about miracles? I'm going to talk to you about miracles. You know nothing about miracles if you didn't witness the Six Days War in 1967. That is the biggest miracle ever. Really, almost 60 million people hate Israel, attack Israel with the military. We're a small, tiny nation of 2 million. We don't have the oil or whatever they used to have. They were supported by other 15 Arab countries at the time. Israel was so tiny. I mean, if you would look at the map of Israel before the 1967 war, you won't even believe we survived it. Guess what? We survived and we tripled the territory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, again and again. It's only the hand of Elohim that can make this happen. No human can make it. Even the bravest nation ever, Israel, blah, 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 cannot make it. We owe it to God. And because he has given his grace and blessing, we have to move on and make more and more of the missions that he gave us. What's the next mission? How many of you believe that the days are coming? Seriously, raise your hand if you believe in it really. If you really see the signs. Because I see it. I know you see it. The season is here. The end of the times are coming, not because I want to say it, but because they're coming anyway, whether I'm going to say it or not. Never have you seen such signs of the end of the times. You go to Revelation, you see everything. You go to Revelation 16, 16, and you better listen to the Jew. We don't really read the Revelation book in, in Israel, I'm telling you. Revelation 16, 16 talks about Armageddon, the big war, the plains of the valley of Joshaphat, 
the kings coming from the north as in Daniel 6. You read about it. You know the war is coming. Let me tell you something about Armageddon. Armageddon is two words in Hebrew that were twisted in, in, in Greek because Greek was the language that translated the Bible uh, at that time. Two words that mean the mountain of Megiddo. Armageddon in Hebrew is Har Megiddo. Megiddo or Megiddo is a small mountain at the center of the valley of Joshua, the valley of Israel. This is where the big wars occurs if we believe in this book, and we do believe in it, don't we? So, the war is going to be there. Armageddon, the Mount of Megiddo, is about 20 miles from where I grew up. I saw this every day. I could just look and see the mountain. I dwelled and I trekked around and I, you know, I traveled all around it. It's there in Israel. The Middle East is falling apart. There's wars all over. The nations and the states that we knew before hardly exist anymore. Radical Islam is pushing everywhere, is killing Christians this week in Egypt. ISIS is pushing all over to create the Caliphate, which is the kingdom, the Muslim kingdom. Iraq does not really exist anymore. It exists on a paper. It's like three, four different zones that don't even communicate between them. Syria is completely dismantled. The kingdom of Jordan, which I have a lot of positive sentiments for, are in big, big troubles because they absorb so many refugees and the king is not really loved by many of his people uh, uh, who, who are basically what they call themselves Arab Palestinians. And then things are happening. The people of Israel are coming back, and in 48, a state is declared, the state of Israel. In 1967, reunification of Jerusalem. Now everything around is a big mess. If you go to all the sources that appear there, you will see that it was predicted that the kings of the north will fight to the kings of the south, and they will invade the valley of Israel and will attack who? The Russians? the Norwegians, the Canadians, the Israelis. Who's going to be there when the war occurs? Us. I'm always tempted, almost tempted to say we're glad to be there. Well, I'm not glad to be in a war, but I got to tell you, if this is what I should do, I will be there and fight in the name of God and for His glory and because this is what I'm supposed to do. The Bible says it. Because when the day of judgment comes, I want to be able to stand there and say, yes, I did what you expected me to do. The enemies have invaded, and I went down to the valley, and I thought in your name, and sometimes we won, sometimes we lost, but everybody knows what's happening at the end of it. Messiah comes, temple descends, and the kingdom of God returns. This is what we want, don't we? Hallelujah. So, when the day of judgment comes, each one of us is going to be asked, what have you done to protect his name, to stand with Israel? You see, I'm not here to just tell you, yeah, support Israel, support Israel. I'm just telling you, it's written here. That's not my wish to replace the word of God. It's there. I just have to announce it again and again. To make sure that we remember, at the day of judgment, each one of you is going to be asked, what have you done? I'm going to tell you that you can do lots of things for Israel today. I have come here today to tell you that the days are coming and we have to wake up. We can't just simply be in church and pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which is great and important. We do extra now. Because these are times and days that demand that we do extra. I want to share a, um, a personal story with you, which I've never done before in the last year, but I'm going to share it with you because I just look at your eyes, and although I'm on stage and there's a couple dozens of you here, I can see your eyes, most of you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something personal. Today, 
is exactly a year, and I shared it with Dr. Paul before, it's exactly a year that a doctor calls me and tells me that I'm diagnosed with lung cancer stage four, and I got a year to live. Don't, 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 don't be sorry for me, hold on. First of all, I hate when people are sorry for me. Let's have fun and enjoy life, right? Let's smile. I love joking, I love laughing, why would I be sorry? So yes, I was sorry for an hour or so. Then I went consulting with other doctors and three of them, besides the first one, told me, you may want to do all your childhood dreams now because you got about a year. And I said, what do you mean when you say a year? Is it like from the 28th of May to the 28th of May or something? And they said, no, it's about a year or so. And I said, why? And they said, because we know no medicine uh, medication, I'm sorry, that, that can heal that kind of, of uh, cancer cell that you have. But I was sorry for about an hour. Sad, not really sorry. I was sad for an hour. And then I said to myself something that helped me go through this year. And I want to tell you, I've already got rid of 85% of all the tumors in my body. 85%. No medication, there is no cure for it. I go through chemotherapy every three weeks, but that's just like a, you know, just like a, a, a treatment they'll just give you, you know? Here's what I said to myself. I prayed. I prayed and I said, Lord, I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of it. First of all, because I believe that whatever we do here is for what happens after life, for the next life. I truly believe in it. Otherwise, what's the use of all the sorrow and problems and hardships that we have here? Why are we measured by our morals and our behavior if there's nothing there after? Of course there's something there. And I'm expecting it. So I'm not afraid to die. Seriously, I'm not. But I said, God, you have a mission for me. You have sent me down from Tel Aviv, from the safe place of Tel Aviv, down to Zderot, on the Gaza border, my house is less than half a mile from the border. Ten years ago when I moved there, it took less than a year. I didn't have to be on the waiting list, so-called, to get a missile hit my home directly. I was on my way in the morning to the shower. It hit directly where I stood a few seconds before. Does he have a shield on me? He has a shield on me. Thank you, Lord, for this. He has a shield. He has a shield on all of you. You just have to put your faith in him. Just put your faith in him. Because he has a mission. My mission was to start the leadership school that will train the Davids and Esthers of Israel to lead the nation through the troubled times that are awaiting us at the end of the days. I didn't need to read the Bible to know that this is my mission. But when I read the Bible, everything was clear to me. The end of the days are coming. The wars are coming. The small nation of Israel, yes, we are powerful, but we're still small, is going to be attacked by millions of millions of enemies, of you and us, not just us. And we have to prepare. We have to make sure that we can stand there against all the enemies. We have to prove to our Lord, our Creator, that we are ready for the mission. And this is part of my mission. And if he wants me to continue with that mission, he will not let me die. That is, why, that is why I am so happy with what I have in the last year. Because the test is a test and I'm standing in it. And I told him, you save me, I will do your mission. Not as a condition, but I will do your mission. Because then I will know that you really chose me to do something to train those Davids and Esthers to be prepared. Now, are you willing to join my fight there? Are you willing to be part of the mission? I'm inviting you to be part of it. You're here in Ohio, I know, but your heart can be there just as well as here. You can be part of that mission. Support what we're doing, stand with us. Don't let the enemies of Israel speak in the streets here because when they speak against Israel, they speak against him. When they say Israel needs to be wiped out of the map, they, they actually defy his word. You cannot be the New Testament if there is no Old Testament. You cannot be part of the house of Israel if we weren't being the firstborn. 
We were there to wait for you when God made you his followers through your Messiah. Now we're here to fight the biggest war ever. Come fight with us. You don't have to do it physically. Do it in your heart. Do it in the support. Come and be part of what we have there as a mission. My mission is yours. You're welcome to join it. You're welcome to be partners in it. Let's do what he expects us to do. Because I have something that I wanted to share with you and now you have it in your own knowledge, in your brains and in your heart. When he has a mission, he guards us. He protects us. He wants us to fulfill that mission. Let's do it together. Thank you very much.